Now that we have done first order equations, it is time to start with second order ODEs. Now, since we are starting second order ODEs, let's take a very simple case. We are going to assume, first of all, a linear ODE. Second assumption is, it is also homogeneous. Okay, these are going to simplify the solution uh, greatly. So we are going to only look at solution of linear second order homogeneous ODEs. Let's write the most general form. Now because it is an ODE, there has to be only one independent variable, which I call it as x. So x is the only independent variable and y is a dependent variable, so y is a function of x. So the ODE has one dependent variable y and one independent variable x. So what is the most general form? Now the dependent variable can have two derivatives because it's a second order ODE. So there should be y double prime term, there should be the y prime term and there can be a y term. And because it is homogeneous, every term should have the presence of the dependent variable. And uh, because it is linear, the coefficients, say for example, I'll call this as p of x, q of x, r of x. The coefficients cannot contain y, but the coefficients can only be a function of x. So, um, this is the most general form. Now, if I divide this by p of x, I have q by p and I have r by p. Now, a function of x divided by another function of x, you can call q of x by p of x as being a of x. And you can call r of x by p of x as being b of x. So, if it has to be linear, second order and homogeneous, then there are certain restrictions. Because it is linear, y, y prime, y double prime should have a degree of 1. They should appear as themselves, not in composites. And also their coefficients can only be functions of x. They should not contain y. So this is the most general form for a linear second order homogeneous ODE. And also because it's homogeneous, every term has to have y uh, or its derivatives. Okay. So let's have that in mind, the most general form. Now, as I have mentioned in the lecture, the most general form does not have an explicit solution. That is, you cannot have a general solution for a given A of X and arbitrary P of X. There's no solution procedure for a second order ODE. In special cases of A of X and B of X, you have a solution procedure. What is the first special case? When the coefficients are all constants. So first let's take the case of a constant coefficient ODEs. You have a solution procedure when the coefficients are all a constant. You would have definitely learned this in your schooling, I, I hope, uh, probably in your 12th class. So it's, it's a good revision now to go through constant coefficient ODEs. The most general form is y double prime plus a y prime plus b y equal to zero. Mind you, I'm still looking at homogeneous equations, so the right hand side is now kept as zero. Now what is the auxiliary equation? The auxiliary equation, how do you obtain the auxiliary equation? You look at the equation and ask what kind of solution satisfies this equation. You come up with y equal to e power mx. So you know that these kind of functions will obey this constant coefficient equation. So you plug it in the differential equation and you end up getting this equation. We'll call it as the auxiliary equation. So the auxiliary equation is m square plus am plus b equal to 0. After you find the auxiliary equation, go in and solve it because it's just a quadratic for second order equations. You solve the auxiliary equation, obtain the roots of the auxiliary equation. Now based on the nature of the roots, you will be able to write the solution directly. Suppose the roots are real and distinct, that is m1 is not equal to m2, m1 and m2 are both real numbers, then the auxiliary uh, equation uh, is solved, then the differential equation has a solution a e power m1 x plus b e power m2 x. Suppose the roots of the auxiliary equation are both real as well as they are equal, then the solution is given by a x plus b e power m x. Suppose the roots are complex, then the solution y c is given by e power alpha x into a cos beta x plus b sine beta x. So this is how you obtain the solution to a linear second order homogeneous constant coefficient ODEs. I'm sure you would be very clear with this. 
just have have in mind how to get the auxiliary equation and once you solve the auxiliary equation how do you get the solution so please have this in your formula sheet before going to the exam just go through this once now coming to uh, cauchy euler equations in cauchy euler equations you see that uh, it is a variable coefficient equation the coefficients are variable they are functions of x not just any function of x but the coefficient should be decreasing powers of x say for example you have x square then next coefficient is x and the next coefficient is a constant that is x power 2 x power 1 and x power 0 corresponding to y double prime y prime and y so if the if the coefficients are decreasing powers of x then you call the ode as a cauchy euler ode now how do you get the auxiliary equation by thinking what kind of solutions are there for this equation so after looking at the equation and thinking of the solution you know that y equal to x power m would be the solution to these equations so you take the solution as y equal to x power m and substitute in the ode then you will arrive at the auxiliary equation so the auxiliary equation is m into m minus 1 plus am plus b equals 0 depending on the nature of roots of the auxiliary equation you will be able to write the solution directly suppose the roots are real and distinct m1 is not equal to m2 then the solution you know it's already of the form x power m so you will have two such uh, terms so a e x power m1 plus b x power m2 if the roots are real and equal both m1 and m2 are equal to m then the auxiliary equation the solution to the ode is given by yc equals a into ln x plus b whole multiplying x power m suppose the roots are complex m1 and 2 equals alpha plus or minus i beta you know complex roots occurs in uh, called pairs so if alpha is the real part and beta is the imaginary part of the complex roots of the auxiliary equation then the solution to the ode is directly given by yc equals x power alpha into a cos beta ln x plus b sin beta ln x now if you look at these two cases there is a one to one correspondence wherever you had e power mx you have x power m wherever you just had x you have ln x that's the only difference between this and that so if you memorize this clearly and you know what change you have to do that table is very easy to memorize i suggest you memorize both of these before going to the exam because cauchy euler equation you get an euler cauchy equation directly you can uh, write the solution in no time if you remember the formula this is about homogeneous equations this is of particular use especially in the non homogeneous equations so this works even for homogeneous equations so it's easier to learn in terms of homogeneous equations that is how do you map euler cauchy odes to constant coefficient equations um the reason why euler cauchy equations do it has a general solution even though it was a variable cauchy equation is because of this fact that a simple transformation of the independent variable maps it to a constant coefficient equation and you know constant coefficient equations are easy to solve so this is the reason why though uh, being a variable coefficient equation this has a general method of solution other variable coefficient second order equations do not have a general procedure of solution though it could be linear it could be linear but if it is a variable coefficient equation there's still no general procedure to solve them all right now what kind of transformation i will tell you the transformation right front x equals e power t or t equals ln x if you define the relation between x and t this way where x is the independent variable in your euler cauchy equation then if you remove x and put instead of x you put an e power t then this equation will get mapped to this equation so under the transformation of the independent variable x to the independent variable t in the euler cauchy equation this equation the above equation gets mapped or with con converted to a constant coefficient equation with the independent variable here being t i am sorry that's a mistake in the constant coefficient equation the independent variable is t that is this is a d square y by dt square plus a minus 1 dy by dt plus b y equals 0 whereas in the euler cauchy equation it's x square d square y by dx square 
plus ax dy by dx plus by equal to 0. Here the independent variable is x, here the independent variable is t. This is Euler Cauchy, this becomes a constant coefficient. What is the mapping that takes this equation to this equation? It is this mapping. Remember, uh, when you change the dependent variable, suppose you want to change y to something else, you want to change y to u, it's much easier in terms of derivatives. But if you're changing the independent variable, it is not so straightforward because you have to change all the derivatives according to chain rule. So this, it makes, uh, it makes it easy to remember it. So you can try it once and finally you remember that using chain rule, x dy by dx can be written as dy by dt and x square d square y by dx square can be written as d square y by dt square minus dy by dt. So if you remember this mapping and also you remember the derivatives, you could easily map an Euler Cauchy equation to a constant coefficient equation. It's not of much use in the homogeneous case because in homogeneous case, anyway you have the table of solutions, you can obtain the solutions easily. But if you have a non-homogeneous case, then it really makes sense that you know this procedure. It, it becomes very helpful in certain problems where you're given a non-homogeneous Cauchy Euler equation, where you first map it to a constant coefficient equation. Then even if it's non-homogeneous, if it's constant coefficients, it's easier to solve. So this is a very nice trick that comes handy in your exams. Having talked about solutions to linear second order homogeneous equations for constant coefficient and Euler Cauchy type, now it's time to speak about some general aspects of these equations. The first is something called the Wronskian test. If y1 and y2 be solutions to a general linear second order equation in the open interval i, then we define the Wronskian of the solutions y1 and y2 as w of x equal to the determinant y1, y2, y1 dash, y2 dash. Now if you see y1, y2 are functions of x, they are functions defined in the interval i. So this determinant has to be also a function of x, which we call it as a Wronskian. This is also de uh, defined in the same interval i. Now there are nice properties of the Wronskian, which tells you some useful information about the solutions y1 and y2 of this equation. The first property of Wronskian is, either the Wronskian is identically zero for every x in that interval, or the Wronskian is non-zero for every x in that interval. So if you take the interval i where you have the solutions, either the Wronskian is zero at every points in that interval, or the Wronskian is non-zero at every point in that interval. What is the use? If you check at any point in the interval, suppose you check the wrong skin at some point in the interval, if the wrong skin is zero at that point, the wrong skin is zero throughout the interval. Or if the wrong skin at one point is non-zero, then the wrong skin remains non-zero at every point in the interval. So this is the property of wrong skin. Either it's identically zero at every point in the interval, or it is identically non-zero for every point in that interval. It cannot be zero at one point and zero at some other point in the interval. That's one nice property. So to check whether the non skin is zero or non-zero, need not check at every point. You can just check at one point. Second property, y1 and y2 are linearly independent on the interval i if and only if the non skin is non-zero on i. Suppose this equation has two linearly independent solutions, y1 and y2 are linearly independent, then the wrong skin has to be non-zero for y1 and y2. So the long, wrong skin tells you about the linear independence of the solutions. Okay, now coming to the general solution, if you have an equation like this, that is y double dash plus p of x y dash plus q of y equal to zero, if y1 and y2 are two linearly independent solution of this equation on an open interval i, then the set of all possible solutions, which is the general solution to this ODE on interval i, is a linear combination of y1 and y2. Suppose you know y1 is one solution and y2 is another solution to this ODE, then if you take a linear combination of y1 and y2, you get the set of all possible solutions to that equation, which you call it as the general solution. Okay, every so possible solution of this equation is contained in the linear combinations of y1 and y2. So this is the idea of a general solution. So take home message is a second order equation can have at maximum 
two linearly independent solutions. So if you find two linearly independent solutions to the second order equation, then the set of all possible solutions, that is the general solution of this equation is found. Start the solution of linear second order non-homogeneous ODEs. We just had a look at linear second order homogeneous ODEs. Now what is the change because of the non-homogeneous term? Let's look at the theorem which talks about the general solution of this second order non-homogeneous equation. If f of x was 0, it became homogeneous. We studied the general solution. The general solution consists of two linearly dependent solutions and set of all possible linear combinations of them. Now if this f of x term is present, this term is, is not containing y. So this is a term without the dependent variable. This is the non-homogeneous term. Right, let's talk about the theorem now. Let y1 and y2 be linearly dependent set of solutions for the associated homogeneous equations on the open interval i. So I am telling y1 and y2 are the solution to the homogeneous equation. Suppose f is 0, then the solution to the homogeneous equation is y1 and y2. Now if yp is one solution, is any solution of this whole equation on the same interval i, then the general solution y of the, of the complete equation on an open interval i is given by y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2 plus yp. That is, the set of all possible solutions to this whole equation is given by the solution to the homogeneous equation plus any one solution to the entire equation. If you know the solution to the homogeneous equation and any one solution to the entire equation, then you know every possible solution to the whole equation. That's what the theorem says. Now we will speak about the solution strategy. To solve y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equal to f of x, three steps has to be followed. What is the first step? Find something called the CF, the complementary function. What is the CF? It is the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation. It's also called yc to represent the complementary solution. And we already studied that yc is made of two linearly independent solutions, y1 and y2, and the set of all linear combinations of them. Second step, find any one solution yp to the whole equation. This is called the particular integral. We learn in detail how to find the particular integral for various f of x, but now I'm just talking about the steps that you have to do. You have to find the CF, the complementary function, then you have to find the PI, which is the particular integral. Then the general solution to the non-homogeneous equation is written as y equals CF plus PI. That is y equals yc plus yp. And you know yc is c1 y1 plus c2 y2. So y can be written as c1 y1 plus c2 y2 plus yp. This expression contains a set of all possible solutions for the equation y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equal to 0. So here I am talking only about the solution structure as well as the solution strategy for second order linear non-homogeneous equation. The presence of this non-homogeneous term brings the complication. Now next we will learn about what are the various methods used to find the particular integral. The particular integral is very important. It's also called a steady state solution sometimes. Uh, it's, some, it's very important and uh, there are many methods used to find the particular solution. It's really important that engineers understand how to obtain the particular integral. The methods to find the particular integrals of second order, non-homogeneous, constant coefficient ODEs. These methods mainly work only for constant coefficient ODEs. Only the method of variation of parameters that I'm going to present works for variable coefficient ODEs. But Method of undetermined coefficients and the shortcut method is only for constant coefficient equations. Please bear that in mind. So now we'll be interested in solving y double prime plus a y prime plus b y equal to f of x. Now, how to find the particular solution corresponding to f of x? You know, f of x is called the forcing term. So I will call the forcing term as f of x. So if your f of x is of exponential type, now, if you look at the equation, stare at it, you'll be able to say that the choice of yp should be some constant into e power alpha x. So, this will be the initial choice of yp. In this method, you look at the forcing term, 
Then you come up with the initial choice of yp. Then you plug that in the equation and then determine the coefficient k. So that's why it's called the method of undetermined coefficient. The form of the solution is known already. You're only finding the unknown coefficient k. All right, suppose you have a forcing with a sine or a cosine term. Then the general, the initial choice for yp is k1 sine omega x plus k2 cos omega x. Whether you have a sine or whether you have a cos or you have a combination of sine and cos, you always have to take a general combination of sine and cos. So two coefficients are there, you plug it in this equation, automatically you get two conditions to find k1 and k2. Suppose you are forcing is a polynomial and remember the equation b is not 0. Suppose b is not 0, the y term is present. Then if you have a polynomial forcing with x power n or some polynomial with a maximum power of n, a degree of n, then the initial choice for yp will be a general nth order polynomial. Just don't stop with x power n, you will not be able to satisfy. You have to take the general whole polynomial with all the terms up to x power n. And you will have conditions to find k1, k2 till kn. You will have n such conditions, so don't worry about that. But you have to choose a general polynomial. So this is the method of undetermined coefficient. Now, this method can fail. When will it fail? When cf looks like the initial choice of yp. Suppose the initial choice of yp looks like one of your cf. That is, cf is made of two functions, y1 and y2. If this initial choice looks like one of the complementary functions, then this will not work as a particular solution. In that case, what you do is, you just multiply it by x. That's all you do. Okay? So suppose k e power alpha x doesn't work. In, in, when will it not work? It will not work when e power alpha x is one of the solutions of the complementary function. Then you choose the initial choice of yp as k x e power alpha x. So suppose that choice doesn't work, then you choose the next choice as kx e power alpha x. Suppose this also doesn't work, then you choose kx square e power alpha x. So you go on, right? The, and at one point, you will get the correct form of yp. And in this case, suppose this initial choice doesn't work, then you multiply by x and then take it as the choice of yp. Here, this will always work because for a constant coefficient equation, you will never have yc as this form. You can have this form, but you can even have this form in case it is imaginary roots, complex roots, you can have this form, but you can never have this form. So no worry here. Uh, if you have a polynomial forcing, method of undetermined coefficient is always going to work. This will be the initial choice of yp. And mind you, this whole thing will work taking into picture b is not 0. Suppose b is 0, then give it a thought what order you have to go. Okay. This is the method that you will usually use in the exam. It's called the shortcut method. And for an exponential forcing or a harmonic forcing, it gives you a very quick answer even when tricky situations appear. So exponential forcing, suppose this is the equation. I write the same equation in the operator d notation. It looks like this. So d square plus ad plus b into y equal to e power ax. And I hope you know what is capital D. Capital D is nothing but d by dx. That's the derivative operator. So 1 by d is going to be integral over dx. Okay. So this is the notation here. Now I call this function as f of d operating y uh, operating on f of d is equal to e power alpha x where I call this thing, this operator as f of d, you could also factorize the operator for exponential forcing. It, it simplifies the idea. So you factorize this as d minus i1 into d minus i2. Now the particular integral can be directly given by yp equals e power alpha x divided by f of d equals alpha. So if you know this is f of d, just put d equals alpha and uh, you bring it to the denominator here you will directly get yp. So this is very easy. So the yp is directly given by e power alpha x divided by f of d equals alpha. Because this is a function evaluated at d equals alpha and alpha is just a number, this will just be a number. So your yp has the form e power alpha x. 
there's something similar to method of undetermined coefficients. Now there could be problem here. The denominator could go to zero. Suppose d is equal to alpha, then this method will not work. Then what you do is you first multiply by x outside, then you differentiate the denominator and then substitute d equals alpha. Okay. When you multiply by x, you take x outside, x will not apply to this operator f of d, x is separate. So you multiply by x and then you differentiate the denominator and then you put x equal to d equal to alpha. Suppose still the denominator becomes 0, that is in case of a repeated root, still the denominator is 0, then what happens? You again do the same thing, you multiply by x outside and you once more differentiate the denominator and then substitute d equal to alpha and now possibly it will work out. Okay. So this is the shortcut method. This is suggested during your exams. Suppose you have exponential forcing, it's always suggested you use this method in the exam because you get the answer very quickly. Now coming to harmonic forcing, when you f of x is sine of omega x or cos of omega x, it works for both. Now I've taken, for example, sine of omega x. You can write it as f of dy equals zero. Now the PA is given by yp equals sine of omega x divided by f of d but you substitute d square equal to minus omega square. So you can only give substitution for d square when it is harmonic forcing. You replace d square by minus omega square. Even if there is a d left out, you, you multiply and divide by the conjugate and then you bring a d square and substitute minus omega square. You do this till you get rid of d terms. And then you get the yp. Again problem can appear. When will problem appear? When you put f of d square equal to omega minus omega square and the denominator becomes zero and this will become zero if your f of d itself does not contain the d term and you have d square plus omega square only in that case it will become zero so in that case what should you do again you multiply by x take the derivative of the denominator and then you apply d square equal to minus omega square because this condition appears only for a particular form of this function f of d, I have already done it for you. That is, f of d is equal to d square plus omega square. Let me write it down. Only for this case, f of d equals d square plus omega square. Suppose you put d square equal to minus omega square, the denominator will grow. Now, if you differentiate, what is f dash of d? f dash of d is 2d, right? So, what will happen when you put f dash of d, you will have a 2 into d. And... Uh, you can either multiply and divide by conjugate and again substitute and proceed or you realize 1 by d is nothing but integral. So you have 1 by d of sin omega x that's equivalent to integral of sin omega x. So the pi is given by x by 2 into integral of sin omega x dx. One common mistake is people take this inside the operator or inside the integral then it becomes wrong. Remember when you multiply by x and differentiate the denominator you keep the x out of the derivative operator, okay, right. So this is a easy method and I always suggest you to use this method whenever you have exponential forcing or harmonic forcing. For polynomial forcing, method of undetermined coefficient is perfectly fine. Though there is a shortcut method for that also, I am not discussing it here because that becomes an even more difficult way to do it. Rather, this becomes a very easy way to do it. This is the last part of ordinary differential equations. Uh, how to find the particular integrals of second order, non-homogeneous, even variable coefficient equations. This is fairly general. Even if it's a variable coefficient equation, it works. This is called the method of variation of parameters. So in short, to know, to find the particular integral using the method of variation of parameters, you should first know the CF. We are going to get the PI from the CF. That's the main idea of this method. Let the linear homogeneous equation, that is if f of x is 0, have the general solution y of x equal to c1 y1 plus c2 y2, where c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants. As far as the homogeneous equation is concerned, c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants. We've already studied the theory. Now, the particular integral for the corresponding non-homogeneous equation, along with the forcing f of x, is taken to be of the form yp equals c1 of x y1 plus c2 of x y2. Now for the homogeneous case, c1 and c2 are arbitrary constants. 
Now, if you assume that C1 and C2 are not constants, but they are functions of x, then that is the form that he has. That is the main idea of method of variation of parameters. Now, starting with this assumption, you substitute it in the original equation, and then you do a lot of algebra, you will end up getting this integral form of yp. Again, you see, it is having this form, c1 y1 plus c2 y2, c1 and c2 are in terms of integrals, that's all. You have to memorize this, if you know this, if you want to know the yp, what all do you need to know? You need to know f of x, that is given by the forcing. You need to know y1 and y2, those are the solutions for the complementary solution of the equation, that is the solution to the homogeneous equation, and the wrong skin. You know the wrong skin is given by this determinant. So if you know the solution to the homogeneous equation, and you know the forcing, then you can find the particular solution directly using this formula. If you plug in everything, you do the integration, you will directly get the yp. That's the advantage. Not This method is not suggested generally in the exam unless it is required. When will it be required? It would be required if the equation is variable coefficient. For example, it is Euler-Cauchy and non-homogeneous. This method would come handy. If it is constant coefficient type, I suggest you do not use this method. Either use method of undetermined coefficient or the shortcut method that I told you. Thank you. With this, we complete ordinary differential equations. However, we still have partial differential equations. Thank you.